Hello, everyone. My name's Joseph Wilk. Uh, I'm talking about poetic technology. Let's just see if this thing works. It doesn't work, so I'm going to move back here. Sorry to keep a distance from you. There's this gulf between us, but uh, I need to be able to tap. So it's, it's fine to kind of like use the word poetry and thinking about the future of creative technology. We have to address the fact that you need money to be poetic. You need to be able to eat and pay the rent and live. And you can't be poetic. You can be poetic without money, but it helps. Uh, and so if we're talking about the future of creative tech, it has to start with getting really good at getting money from people, because that is how you help shape what the creative tech sector will look like and how you can participate and be a part of it. So in sharing that, um, the White Pube have an amazing funding library if you want to try and get good at uh, being a part of the creative tech sector, that's a great resource to learn about how to get really good at applying for money from people. It's important to recognize with technology uh, that we really don't have control of it. Uh, by that, I mean that often it's not necessarily the tech. It's those that own the tech and how they use it. Um, simple fact of if you want to make your own VR headset, that is such a vast investment of money. Um, so a lot of the tools that we have in creative technology are beyond our control. We don't actually define how they work. People do that for us, and then we get to use them. This doesn't discount the idea that we can be uh, creative, disruptive, and play with our ideas and create beautiful things, but it's very important to acknowledge that even the ideas that we create reinforce this control. It's important to be aware of it, and it's important to recognize that a lot of creative technology is based on things we don't control, and we don't necessarily agree with the agenda of that technology. So what does the poetic look like to the creators of these creative tools? Yeah. <laughs> a dead inside is, is how I would describe that. Um, it is, this is that point that I'm not sure why I can't put my finger on necessarily why this happens, but often the people who create the technology are unable to dream the dreams and simply have the ideas of the, the of, a, of an average lived experience in this world is so removed from reality in Silicon Valley, so not representative of diversity, uh, so trapped in a system of profit and shareholders that it's very difficult to genuinely be poetic. And I think this is a, a perfect example of that. Uh, one of the uh, best experiences I've ever had uh, in a kind of interactive, creative, um, environment was something called Space Wars, I'm sorry, the Alien Wars. Um, a long time ago, probably 20 years ago, interactive theatre at the Trocadero in London based on the Alien franchise, effectively actors running around in rubber alien suits scaring people. Uh, and the best part of this experience, um, which is often such a core part of VR experiences, was the queue waiting to get into this, this event. And that's because at the exit and the queue, every 10 minutes, a group of people burst out the door screaming, running, going, ah, as they kind of came out of this experience. And you just sit in the queue going, what am I doing? This is, why am I here? This is terrifying. And it, we queued for like an hour. And it's, it's beautiful to me that the best part of this experience was the queue, right? Like technology often doesn't have this concept of the seams of an experience and where things begin and end. That was the event, but the best part was the fact that that event was designed to explore the outside world and what the experience is like of just waiting, which is a massive thing in VR. Queuing in museums to have a go on VR headsets could be part of an experience. Also, how technology fits within social contexts. Um, this is a project I did called Wheel Trails, uh, which uses augmented reality to draw using a wheelchair's motion. It, it's a very simple technology solution. Uh, and the technology itself is not poetic. It's the fact that the social context within which the AR and the digital work is presented is one of ideas around the fact that a wheelchair is about sedentariness, about inactivity, about being trapped, about not being free. And the technology does not make this poetic. The technology is almost can be erased. And what is important is that in the wheelchair user's experience, 
they change the way that they see the space and the way they behave because there is something in their pocket that is enabling them to draw. And that technology in their pocket could disappear and it's still the same experience because it's about how the person has changed their frame of reference for seeing the space. So I always have this litmus test of the, for me, the most poetic and the projects that I enjoy the most are where the technology could almost not be there and you still get the same effect of changing the way that people see the world. Technology also frames that we have to go faster, better graphics, better processing. Everything is about speed. Um, this is an artist called Ishak Bertan who asked the, the counter question of how slow can a CPU run? How slow can a computer be? Uh, this is a very simple kind of arcade game that takes one day to process, uh, the, the, the CPU takes one day to process the information. So you can only ever make one move a day. So like playing Tetris, but you're allowed to move your block once every day, which again, like completely changes the way that you experience that technology and changes it from a thing about accelerationism and about speed and being better to a meditative slow process, which I think technology could do with a lot more of. It's also important to address uh, the climate and that creative tech as well as having an amazing potential for such, such, such beautiful projects also has a huge amount of harm associated with it. So this is a project by Carl McDonald, um, which is all about the fact that various marketplaces that sell NFTs, digital uh, things that get sold for money, are effectively generating huge amounts of carbon in the process of these. So he created effectively a NFT project which is listed on each of these markets, which is the cost it would take to recapture all the carbon that they have polluted. So effectively using their platforms to express the damage they have done to the world and that they do not want to deal with that damage. Um, creative tech has to deal with the consequences of mass polluting technology and really evaluate and question whether sometimes things are worth Machine learning, uh, kind of using AI to generate images, is also a massive area, uh, I think, around the climate, about also about human labor. I think uh, a lot of what we've seen in the pollution and NFTs and the idea that you can generate such vast quantities of harmful effects to people in the world is abstracted through our technology. And machine learning, again, is another example of abstracting human labor. Uh, and lots of people over the last week have been telling me how they've now using uh, creative AI in advertising campaigns and how humans are going to become relevant in creativity. And I think if we're imagining a future, it's important to acknowledge that this is theft of people's work that has been repackaged as a trained model that is then used to generate content. And it's the same practice if we look at environmentalism about how we harm the planet for profit without any cost for the pollution. It's the same as if we look at uh, the machine revolution and the abstraction of labor and how we click a button on Amazon and everything that happens in between and all the people are abstracted and hidden away, not necessarily paid well, about, uh, about the iPhone and how it's produced and how it's abstracted from it. Uh, the future of creative tech is paying people and acknowledging their value and worth. Check my time. Very good. I also think creative tech has a, has a bad habit of sometimes approaching care as a very temporary fix, mainly associated with how we fund projects in creative tech. But often it's about having an intervention where we might run a workshop, run an event. We provide a group of people with a network to talk and share about experiences, often through creative technology, and then the project ends and that's the end of that care. And I think we have to acknowledge that creative technology needs to provide longer term care because actually short term care while it fits in the funding models, can be extremely harmful as well. And once you've gone away and your project has run out of money, there are still people left there with experiences of the world, experiences of marginalization, who have to live in these worlds. And I think we need to be better in the future at creating longer term communities of care. Part of creative tech is also inverting the narratives of what we see around us. This is a project called Medusa FPS by Carolina. Uh, is a first-person shooter computer game where the gun automatically seeks people 
and your job is to make sure people don't get shot. So you have to try and put things between yourself, you have to try and aim away, and it, it, just, says, it just says so much about the idea of not shooting people in a game is so revolutionary, and what that says about our gaming industry, and it's, it's, it's such a thought-provoking project, and I think, again, if the future of creative tech is really challenging what exists in our narratives and asking really difficult questions, is why is it fun to shoot people in computer games, and why is it really so emotively triggering to not shoot people? I think creative technology also often presents itself as an inevitable. I think especially around things like the metaverse and VR. Um, my nine-year-old daughter um, is, a, is a gamer, uh, is a very good at uh, Overwatch and Fortnite and plays lots of games like this. And I often wonder, I'm old, I'm in my 40s, and I often think my reservation of VR is this a product of my age. So I often have a conversation with her of like, you know, are you interested in VR? Are your friends interested in VR? Do you think this looks like what we just saw from Zuckerberg's image? Is this cool to you? Is this interesting? And I was trying to like say, you know, would you like a go on a VR headset? You know, we could try and organize that. And she was like, okay, dad, like, this all sounds cool, but what I really want in this moment in time is blue tack. I was like, okay. Blue tack. It's like, why, why, why do you want blue tack? And like, this is a very digitally competent young girl. And it's like, well, you know, all my friends are playing with blue tack. Like, it's squidgy. You can add water to it. You can color it. It's like everyone's having so much fun with it. You can build things out of it. You can stick things in it. And I think it's important to appreciate that just because the metaverse exists as a concept and we can build it does not make it inevitable. And there is clearly something rooted in us as humans about the tangible world. And I think VR has the potential to be amazing and create incredible experiences. But trying to portray that it is an inevitable replacement of physical, tangible experiences is just leaning heavily into the unpoetic and the whole commercial narrative of companies like Meta. And it needs to be challenged. Uh, finally, um, one really, really interesting thing around technology and especially around narratives and immersive experiences, is that tabletop role-playing games, a group of people sitting around playing make-believe, is still one of the most creative for, uh, experiences, a social making up stories as you go along. It's full of the most diverse, interesting. This is a Jane Austen role-playing game where you just get pretend to be characters from Jane Austen. Uh, there is no computer game, there is no movie, there is no interactive experience that has the level of creativity, the freedom of a bunch of people just making stuff up as they sit around. And I think uh, we can learn from this. Uh, I think the creative sector could learn a lot from uh, tabletop role-playing games and also that again, maybe that technology doesn't belong there. Maybe actually humans and telling good stories with each other is a core thing we like to do face to face and technology doesn't necessarily need to be involved. So in, in my summation of like, what is the future of creative tech? This was my little mini rant, which I hope was interesting of, I think we should have more cues and think about what those are and why they're fun. We're British, cues are good. More slowness, technology does not have to be fast. Thinking about the environment, absolutely everything needs to be a think about this. It's fundamental to our survival on this planet, so it's quite important. Uh, paying people for their work, not stealing. Um, about having strangeness, inverting narratives, uh, focusing on diverse voices, which this uh, whole project and Bath Creative City R&D and PM Studios and the studios and everyone really supports and is extremely important. Um, Saying you no know, thank you to technology, of someone trying to sell you the metaverse as a replacement for your life, it's okay to say, no, good, thanks. And that doesn't make you a Luddite, although there's a whole narrative around Luddites, which I'll skip. Um, but you know, it's okay to say no, and that's fine. And also more connection, more, more humans, right? More talking to each other and more social engagement and stuff like this. So yeah, more, more poetry and less demo. That's the future of creative tech. Thank you.